preparing graphs and interpreting graphs is something that is very important both in chemistry and science in general. Graphs are also important in a number of other fields. Nearly every type of engineering, the health profession, business, politics, um, many, many different areas use graphs as a way to quickly display a large set of data. This experiment focuses on preparing and interpreting a number of different graphs through a few different ways. You can prepare graphs in a number of different ways, either on, uh, by hand on graph paper or through a number of different uh, programs. Your calculators can graph, uh, phones will have graphing apps, and there are a number of different softwares available to prepare graphs. Uh, Excel, MATLAB, Maple Origin, Google Sheets, all of these different things can prepare a graph to show a large amount of data in a quick visual representation. This experiment is focusing on preparing those graphs. And while the overall experiment is not specifically a chemistry experiment, using these graphs and interpreting them will help throughout the rest of this lab course and through the rest of chemistry and beyond. This first experiment focuses on graphs and the importance of graphs. Uh, throughout the experiment, you will be determining slope and intercept from data points as well as different graphs and preparing your own graphs. Graphs are something that are very important, not only in chemistry, but in almost every other topic from history, business, all science, engineering, the medical field, uh, knowing how to create and interpret different graphs is useful, if not required, for a number of these different fields. Graphs are used to display a large amount of information in a quick way. Uh, in place of a large table with a a lot of numbers, a graph can be used to see what is the overall trend of those numbers over time or over the course of the material. Does, does the number increase? Does it decrease? You wouldn't necessarily know that instantly from a big table of numbers, but from a graph, you can see that quickly. There are a lot of different types of graphs from uh, bar graphs or histograms, line graphs, pie charts. But in this course, we will be using what's referred to as a scatter plot. This is where both the X horizontal axis and the Y vertical axis vary with each other. So it's not a set one, two, three, four, five going across the bottom. It's whatever the data points happen to be. A lot of the graphs in the course are going to be linear graphs. That is, they're going to give straight lines. And a straight line has the equation form of y equals mx plus b, where y is the value along the y-axis, that vertical axis, up and down. x is the value of the data point along the horizontal axis, left to right. m is the slope of the graph, which is the, uh, the rate of change. How much does the y value change if you move the x value. That's what the slope indicates. And b is the y-intercept. Where does the line, where does this graph cross uh, the y-axis? 
this would be the same point where x is equal to zero. If you set x equal to zero, that whole term cancels out. So you're left with the equation of y equals the intercept value. Throughout the experiment and throughout the course, you're going to be calculating slope and intercept for these straight lines. Uh, calculating slope can be done very easily through graphing programs or uh, even calculators, things like that, but it is good to know what the slope actually is and if you have just a couple of data points without a graph, you can figure out what the slope of that linear straight line is. So as I just mentioned, the slope is the rate of change at which the y values change with respect to the x values. A slope of one would mean that every time x increases by one, y also increases by one. Uh, Calculating the slope is termed the change in y over the change in x. Between two different points, the difference between the y values divide it by the difference between the x values. Any two points can be used to, to make a straight line. You can think about if you have two points, if you have two objects anywhere, you can draw a straight line between them, and you can calculate a slope from that. Um, so yeah, looking at the slope, you have the change in y over change in x, or the second y value minus the first y value over the second x value minus the first x value. A lot of times this can also be referred to as final minus initial. Where is your starting data point? Where is your ending data point? So now that I've talked a little bit about graphs, I'm finally showing you one. Here is a graph of a straight linear line. You have the x axis going uh, left to right and the y axis going up and down, vertical with this straight line. On this straight line, there are two specific data points that I highlighted. In this point, you have seven and 4.375. When you're given a set of data points like this, the X value is first, and the y value is second. That means it, for this particular point, the x value is seven and the y value is 4.375. There's also a second data point listed down below, which is negative five for the x value and negative 3.125 for the y value. Looking at the change in y, the change in height, you have one data point minus the second data point. So 4.375 minus negative 3.125. That is a difference of a value of 7.5. It is 7.5 units from this point all the way up to this line right here. The same can be done with the x value where you have seven minus negative five, and that's a difference of 12, meaning from this data point to this data point, it is 12 units wide. Overall, the slope is change in y over change in x, the rise, the height, over the run, 
the length. So therefore the slope of this particular line in this example is 0 0.625. This slope is constant throughout the entire line. Any two points you pick on the line itself will give you a slope of 0 0.625. The next portion of the straight line is the intercept value. And this is where the graph uh, or where the line intersects the y-axis. In this previous slide, it, I made sure the point crosses through zero. The intercept is zero. It crossed right at the zero mark. But when you're go not every graph will cross the y-axis at the zero mark. It will have a slope associated with that. And to calculate that just from the numbers, just from the data point, um, all you need is a single data point, one xy value, and you should have the slope as well. So now in this case, I have a graph with the same slope. So notice the intercept changed, but the slope did not. This, uh, by changing the intercept, you are just moving the graph up and down somewhere. If you change the slope, you'll be changing the pitch or the rotation of this line. But by changing the intercept, all you're doing is moving the line up and down. So if I have this line, now I have two different data points. If you go through the slope calculation, these two data points will give you the same exact slope, 0 0.625. But I can pick one of these data points, a point that's exactly on the line itself, and if I know the slope, I can solve for what the intercept is. The equation for a straight line is y equals mx plus b. So if I know the slope, that m value, and I have, well, at this data point, the x value is 7, and the y value is 7. 375. These are the data points. So you can plug in the x value for x, the y value for y, and since you have the slope, you can run through this calculation to figure out what is the intercept for this particular line. When you have a set of data on your own and you need to prepare a graph from it, you first need to figure out which set of data, which column of numbers would be going on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, or the y-axis, the vertical axis. And typically in a lab setting, like a chemistry lab, the x-axis would be the value that you control that you are physically changing. That is the independent variable. If you're changing the thermostat from uh, one setting to another, that's what you're controlling. And whatever happens because of that, the temperature goes up, that would be on the y-axis. So uh, in the case of something like concentrations and uh, volume, you're choosing, let's say, the size of the container, you're choosing uh, that. So as you change the size of the container, what would be dependent on that? Um, so once you have figured out what you should put on the x-axis and what you should put on the y-axis, you should look at the scaling. So if your data only goes from one to 10, you should not make a giant graph that goes all the way out to 100. Uh, there will be a lot of empty space on that graph then, and you really don't need that. 
either if you were to graph by hand or if you were doing um, a graph through a graphing program. Uh, the other thing would be to make sure the scales or the values on the numbers are evenly placed. So the graph itself, the axis numbers should be evenly spaced. So on this graph here, I go from 0, 5, and 10, and each of the markings in between then would be one unit. You would not put a graph that lists, uh, let's say for the y-axis, negative 0 0.125, then 2, then 5, then 7.375. That's all over the map. You want to make sure the axis values, the scale, is evenly spaced. Um, when you're graphing something, again, either, if this is either by hand or through a graphing program, you want to make sure that, is, that it is appropriately labeled. In the previous graphs that I showed, if these were to be handed in, they would not get very good scores. They're not labeled with anything. There are numbers. These graphs, while I use them to show how to calculate slope and intercept, are literally pointless for anything else. You want to make sure a graph conveys the information that you want uh, the viewer to see. So because of that, you want to include some sort of a title. What is this a graph of? Uh, in this case, I have the sample graph, a calibration curve of crocine scarlet dye at 480 nanometers. I gave a lot of information, but in a very short, precise title. This happens to be a calibration graph. I have the chemical name listed, and I have this constant value, which is uh, the wavelength of light used for this. So if you're given something that's held constant, especially something that can change, uh, if you're given that, that should be included in the title. So if you're given something where it says the temperature of all of this data is 50 degrees, and then it gives you a bunch of data, in the title you should list that the data being shown in the graph was at a constant 50 degrees. So you want to make sure that any of those sort of uh, constant values for the data set are included in the title. Uh, then you want to make sure that the axes themselves are uh, also have a title. So what is the title or what is the x-axis? What are these values? What is the y-axis? What are these values? Um, in this case, I'm graphing concentration versus absorbance, which is a measurement of how much light uh, a chemical will block. And very important, include the units. In this particular example, I have the units of concentration as ppm, parts per million. But concentration can also be listed in percent, molarity, parts per billion. Uh, there are a lot of different units that can measure and mean a concentration. So when you're graphing something, you need to make sure that the units of these values are also indicated in the title. So a viewer would know that, oh, this is going up to 40 parts per million, not 40%. Um, when you're doing a graph, especially for in this course where you're only going to have a limited number of data points, you want to make sure to include all of these separate data points so that way the viewer uh, 
or the person looking at the graph can see the exact measured values throughout the entire uh, data set. And last, you want to look, uh, make sure that it has a trend line. This is the line of best fit that goes through the data. So it doesn't have to fall or all of the data points don't have to be exactly on the line. This is an approximation of overall, what does the data show? Other things that you can also include on a graph, they're not necessarily uh, mandatory, but can be nice depending on the circumstance, would be grid lines uh, like these, some professors like them, some professors don't. So get a sense for that. But uh, in general, they're not necessarily good or bad. It's just a way for uh, the viewer to get a better approximation uh, if they were using the graph directly. If you have multiple lines graphed on the same graph, you want to include some sort of a legend or table to say which line is what. Um, especially for linear graphs like this, it might be useful to include the equation of the line as well as the R squared value. This would be much more uh, useful in upper level courses. Uh, chemistry would be physical chemistry or analytical chemistry, uh, but also a lot of engineering courses or physics courses uh, because the R squared value is a measurement of how precisely this line, this equation fits with your data set. So one more thing about uh, trend lines. When you're looking at trend lines, like I said, the data points do not have to fall exactly on the line. They can be, the line itself is the line of best fit, the trend for the data. Um, but because of that, if you're going to be calculating slope or in a slope and intercept of a data set, you need to choose values that are on the trend line itself, not necessarily individual data points. So this black line is the overall trend, the overall line of best fit for this data. So to find the equation of the line, the slope and the intercept for these values, you would choose two points on the line itself. However, if I chose, let's say this data point here and up here, the straight line between them is very different than the trend of the entire data set. Same thing with these two points over here, these last two. Uh, if I'm looking just at these two data points, there is a much different slope and intercept between them, and that does not represent the whole data set as a whole. So especially for if you're graphing by hand, uh, you should always make sure to calculate the slope and intercept using points that actually uh, fall on the line. In the experiment itself, you're going to be preparing five different graphs and answering a few questions about those particular graphs. The data that you're going to be graphing is provided in the lab manual itself, and you can use that to generate the graphs. The data that you're actually uh, going to be graphing is real chemical data. The data that you're looking at is based on pressure and temperature of gases. And this is a topic that will be covered towards the end of the course. While you're using data that's coming from a topic you haven't covered yet, 
the overall concept is the same. You're looking at the numbers and plotting them on an X and Y coordinate system in order to interpret what those numbers actually mean. In the first data set, you're looking at how pressure and volume of a particular gas are related. And this relationship is known as Boyle's Law and again is covered later in the semester. The second part of the experiment looks at the relationship of temperature and volume. And this is the relationship known, known as Charles's Law. And the third part of the experiment looks at specifically the vapor pressure of water and how that's changing based on the temperature. In part A, there will be two graphs that you'll prepare. Part B, there's only one graph. And in part C, there's also two graphs. Part A is what typically will be done in the lab setting itself. This first part, part A, looking at the relationship of pressure and volume, you're going to be preparing these two, uh, these two graphs by hand during the lab session. The information that you're graphing is provided in the lab manual. You're looking at pressure and volume. The report itself indicates that the volume is being changed and because of that the pressure is changing. This way the volume is the independent variable that you as uh, being in a lab are is controlling and that's that would be placed on the x-axis. The pressure is the dependent variable that is changing because the volume changed, and this is typically placed on the y-axis. The two graphs that you're going to be preparing by hand are first looking at pressure and volume. Make sure uh, to label both of the axes with the appropriate, unit, uh, appropriate units. The x-axis will be the volume in liters and the y-axis will be the pressure in units of atmospheres. And a title should also be included in the graph, including any other information that's provided in the experiment uh, itself. The second graph that you'll be preparing by hand is looking at the inverse volume versus the pressure. The axes that the inverse volume will be placed on is the same as the volume. These are both measurements and since volume is the independent variable, the calculated property will still be the independent variable. So the inverse volume will be placed on the x-axis and pressure will be on the y-axis. The inverse volume is simply one divided by the volume, and it still has units. The units would either be one over liters or liters to the negative one power, inverse liters. And when you do this, you'll realize that in some ways, graphs can look uh, in one way. And if you change one of these properties, if you just perform a simple calculation on volume, you'll see how the data changes based on that calculation. While graphing by hand is not really uh, too necessary anymore, it is still important to know at least the function of using graph paper and how to graph by hand. If you are graphing by hand, it must always be done on a piece of graph paper, not plain paper. The graduations in the graph paper indicate the level of precision of the type of graph it is. Also, when preparing a graph, you would need to use a straight edge or a ruler to make the appropriate marks.
using the, the ruler to make the individual axes as well as any individual data points or trend lines that happen to be linear. All graphs on a piece of graph paper would need a scale in both the X and Y coordinates. Every graph, whether by uh, done by hand or through any type of uh, graphing program, also needs axes labels and a title. When you're graphing the points in the lab, you'd find the x, uh, the x value and the y value on the graph based on the graduations of the graph paper and plot the appropriate point. If the trend happens to be a linear trend, you should use a ruler to plot a line of best fit through the data. If the trend happens to be a nonlinear trend, where a ruler does not necessarily uh, is not necessarily very appropriate, the lab also has what's called flexi curves. These are bendable edges which you could bend to the shape of the particular curve that you're wanting to graph and draw the line of best fit accordingly. In this way, you get a smooth line through the data uh, that is not necessarily linear. The second part of the experiment, you'll be graphing temperature versus volume, looking at this relationship. In this case, the temperature will be the independent variable that's being adjusted, and the volume is the dependent variable. While you may have time to work on these, uh, this graph in the lab session itself, and you absolutely can, if you uh, don't have time to work on this, uh, this would, graph would be due as homework. Starting with this graph though, and throughout the course and through the, uh, the rest of the report and the rest of the course itself, any other graphs can be done using graphing programs, Excel, Google, uh, Origin, etc. And these would just be printed out and then submit it with your lab report. Any graphs generated by a program still need to be properly labeled and include all of the same information. Um, but you could use uh, a graphing program instead. When you're looking at this particular graph, you're going to see what is the information provided about these variables, and that would be included in the titles. Make sure that both axes are labeled <clears throat> with the appropriate units. Temperature is in units of degrees Celsius, and the volume this time is in units of milliliters. You'll notice this will be a straight linear graph, so you can use the data and use your trend line to determine the slope and the intercept of this graph. Once you have the equation of that line, the y equals mx plus b format, you have the slope and you have the intercept, you can then calculate the temperature if the volume was listed as zero. So notice all of these volumes are positive numbers, they're above zero. Once you have that equation, if you put volume as zero 
what would the temperature be? Uh, and you're going to calculate what is the percent error based on the true value. If volume is set to zero, that would be uh, giving a temperature of what is called absolute zero. And it should be negative 273 degrees Celsius. So you're going to be calculating a percent error based on your graph uh, measurements. Using your graph and your trend line, you'll calculate what is the volume of or the temperature, absolute zero, and then calculate this percent error. The percent error is the absolute value, which is just the positive value of the measured number minus the true or the correct value divided by the correct value. In this case, this true value, this correct number is negative 273 degrees Celsius. So you'll go through, prepare a graph, and then use the graph to calculate a specific property. In the third part of the experiment, you're going to be looking at the vapor pressure of water. And you're going to be preparing two graphs. The first graph is looking specifically at the temperature as the independent variable and the vapor pressure as the dependent variable. These graphs, again, can be prepared in lab by hand if, they're, if you have uh, time to do that, but also they could be pre uh, prepared through any sort of a graphing program and turned in. Vapor pressure itself is the pressure that the gas phase of a material uh, exerts on the outside, on, on its surroundings. So in the case of something like water, liquid water at varying degrees, varying temperatures, will generate a small amount of water vapor or gas. This is through evaporation. And the pressure that the evaporated water puts onto the surroundings is the vapor pressure. So in this uh, first graph, you're plotting temperature in degrees Celsius as the independent variable. And what's dependent on the temperature is the vapor pressure in units of millimeters of mercury. That's a standard uh, pressure unit. So the temperature will be the x-axis and the vapor pressure will be the y-axis. As with all graphs, they will uh, the graph will need to be appropriately labeled. So both axes needs to be labeled with the appropriate units and any other information that would be provided in uh, the graph title. You're going to plot a trend line through the data. The trend line, again, does not necessarily need to touch every single point, but gives a representation of what those data points uh, are. And it does not always need to be linear. You'll notice this first graph is not linear, but the so a trend line would not be a perfectly straight line cutting across the data points, but a smooth line that is a general representation of how the data looks. You're also going to do what's called an extrapolation. You'll notice that the vapor pressure only goes up to a, uh, a value of 633.9 millimeters of mercury. The, the pressure of the atmosphere, the pressure of the air, the outside surroundings is 760 millimeters of mercury. So what you'll be doing is drawing this trend line or having this trend line uh, in place and then extending that. What do you think the line is going to do as the vapor pressure was, was uh, to increase up to a value of 760? 
And once the vapor pressure reaches that point, you'll look to see where on your graph is that temperature. What temperature will it be 760? And that temperature is the boiling point of the substance, where the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure, the pressure of its surroundings, that would be the temperature where it boils. So you're going to use the graph to estimate what that particular temperature is. The second graph involves a few different uh, calculations using those individual measurements. You're going to be converting the temperature in units of degrees Celsius into the temperature in units of Kelvin. And the Kelvin scale is just shifting the y-axis of Celsius. So the Kelvin unit is just the Celsius value plus the constant of 273. So you'll be adding 273 to each of these Celsius values. And now that is the temperature in units of Kelvin. Next, you'll take the inverse of that value. So one divided by the temperature in Kelvin. And again, it still has a unit associated with it. It's either one over K or inverse K, inverse Kelvin, K to the negative one. You'll also take the natural log of the vapor pressure. So this is LN on uh, the calculator. So you'll just take the LN natural log of the vapor pressure. And now by doing that, it doesn't necessarily have a particular unit. The graph you're going to be looking at is the inverse temperature. And again, this is the same axes as regular temperature. So this would still be the X axes. And you'll plot that against the natural log of the vapor pressure on the Y axis. Now we're in the first graph of part C, you saw that it was not linear. By doing these sorts of functions and doing these sorts of manipulation to the data, you can change what the graph is representing and have it be presented in a linear straight line, which is much easier to work with. So again, the graph should include all appropriate labels um, and units, as well as a title. You'll run a trend line through that data and determine the slope of that trend line. And in the lab report itself, you're given an equation that utilizes the slope and you're asked to solve this particular equation based on your slope value. Overall, you're looking at all of these different graphs, seeing how you can visually represent them, how this data can be quickly and easily displayed in a graphical format, and using these graphs um, to answer a few questions and so where you're able to interpret what the graphs can tell you about the data. Um, when you are doing a graph by hand, it must always be done on graph paper. So no loose leaf paper, no computer paper. Any hand-drawn graphs must be on graph paper. And for part B and part C that you would be doing outside of class, if, if you would like, um, they can be done either by hand on graph paper or through any sort of a graphing program. So part A, which you're going to be doing in the lab session itself, is preparing two graphs by hand. First, looking at pressure versus volume of a gas, and second, looking at pressure versus the inverse volume of the graph of the gas.
both of these graphs should be properly labeled and nearly complete it before you leave lab and your instructor can check over them to make sure that they're uh, done correctly and appropriately labeled. Afterwards, for part B, you're going to be just preparing one graph of pressure versus the volume of a gas. You're determining the slope and intercept and developing an equation of the trend line and using that trend line to calculate a, a value, the absolute zero value, and basing this or calculating the percent error based on the known or the correct absolute zero value. The last part in part C, you're preparing two more graphs, either by hand or through a graphing program, looking at the vapor pressure of water. First, you'll be plotting the temperature versus the vapor pressure of water. And the second graph will be the inverse temperature in units of Kelvin versus the natural log of the vapor pressure of water. And you can extend what's and extrapolate the trend line of these graphs to determine based on this data, based on this measured data, what would be the boiling point of water. Overall, you're going to be preparing a number of graphs throughout the assignment. You're going to be preparing a few of them in lab by hand on graph paper, as well as a num uh, the other labs which you can do either at home or if there's time uh, in the lab. You're working with these graphs and using them to interpret scientific data that can be used throughout chemistry.